have to do this. We've only got to, we've got to finish up this chapter. We've kind of stuck our big toe into it last week, chapter 21. And um, so, all right, but before we, we jump headlong into the New Jerusalem, um, let us do what we did not do last week, and that was when we were talking about restoration. We really didn't get into um, a good read of um, Second Peter, the passage that I was talking to. That's the one that's very controversial. Everybody, it's the go-to chapter to demonstrate that. You know, after the millennium, all of a sudden, there's going to be this new heaven, new earth that destroys everything, and God starts all over and rebuilds everything fresh, and they'll run to Second Peter 3. And um, I just want to kind of hammer home a few points that I noticed in uh, this passage. And then we remember last week, we looked at the parent passage to Second Peter 3, and that was Isaiah 65. And of course, Isaiah 65, what we saw was, well, no, the new heaven and new earth is happens at the same time as, I mean, it's part of the millennium. It's one of the first events that happens in the millennium. I saw a new heaven and new earth, and then Jesus is making everything new, and we get into kingdom, and everything's kingdom language. So what does all this mean in, in um, 2 Peter 3? And 2 Peter 3, as we pointed out, is the only passage in the Bible that, even goes into that type of a thing and starts describing something that sounds like everything's being nuked and destroyed and, and remade all over again. And, and uh, at the same time, we noted that it's remarkable that um, John, if, if it happens in that way, um, in the way we traditionally have been tending to look at that passage, 2 Peter 3, from various backgrounds, everybody says new heaven, new earth. Well, the Bible talks about that. Second Peter three, it's going to be this big, you know, nuke thing that happens, and God's going to, you know, uh, release all the atoms and cause them all to explode and whatever, and He's going to make everything all new again out of nothing, or whole cloth, as it were. That's the only passage that talks about it. Second Peter three, and then John doesn't even mention it at all. So that should be a red flag right there. But the other thing to do too is that we this is this kind of for me seals why it's so important um, in what we do with our hermeneutic, the way we interpret scripture. We should always interpret scripture with other scripture because the same author is the author of everything. And uh, so regardless of who the writers are, as far as the men that God used to write the scripture, um, the Holy Spirit ruled it all. So it should all agree with itself. And it's a principle called synthesis. It should all agree with each other. So if we find a passage that stands alone like this, then we say, okay, we should be looking at it and questioning, am I looking at this the right way? Maybe I need to revisit it. And that's exactly what, you know, I began, that's the process I began a few years ago. So um, Second Peter 2, you could start with chapter 1 because I'm going to show a pattern here that Peter is getting into, and um, just generally. So he has his greeting and grace and peace in, in verse 2. Um, verse 3, he says, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and goodness, life and godliness. Um, we've been um, given everything through these we may be partakers of the divine nature, so we get to be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption um, that is in the world through lust. And then he gets in talking about uh, our faith and, and how we grow and persevere and what our faith should look like, how it should be lived out in chapter 1. Um, then in, in verse 10, if you do these things, you'll never stumble. That's fascinating. And um, so then he gets into, um, jumps, jumps right into where some of the problems are that he is confronting in his letter before he even gets out of chapter 1 or verse 16. He says, for we did not follow 
cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Majesty, In other words, he's saying we were there. You know, we apostles, we were there. For um, he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he, chapter 2, and of course the chapter divisions aren't um, inspired. Some will argue that they are, but they, these came centuries later. Um, but in chapter 2 um, is where we see he starts going into um, some of these destructive doctrines. And verse 4 says, For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them to hell and delivered them to chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So he's getting into this judgment language now. And through all of chapter 3, he's getting into discussing um, you know, what's going to happen to these people and, and the nature, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah and so forth is mentioned in here in verse 6. Verse 12 of chapter 2 says, But these like uh, natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed speak evil of the thing they do and do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count a pleasure to carouse in the, in the daytime. So he he's going and talking about judgment of um, of these people and, and the deceptions of false teachers he gets into uh, along about verse 18. And so he is um, speaking in judgment and uh, verse, verse 20 of chapter 2, for if they, after they escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Savior Jesus Christ, um, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. So he's talking about all this judgment that's, that's going to be happening. Um, verse 22, but it, and it's happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Then verse 3, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, both of which I stir up your heart to minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. So he's adjuring them of some of these cautions that he's spoken to them before. And um, then he talked, in verse 7, he's saying, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise. Or it's, it's not like he's going to forget. You know, uh, whether it's one day or a thousand days, it's all the same to God. He exists outside of time. He lives in eternity. Um, so then we get into the famous passage um, in uh, verse 10 of chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So here we get to this provocative passage. Now the day of the Lord, um, the day of the Lord is when? We've, dis we've discussed this numerous times. Don't be afraid to, sp to speak up, even if you feel like you're going to be wrong. Mm -hmm. The day of the Lord, I mean, it's it's a phrase that we see often in the Old Testament. And we see it speaking broadly and generally of a number of events that we can pin down to the entire tribulation period, that entire week, reaching its pinnacle in the second coming, the day of the Lord when he judges the nations. And um, that is uh, also where we identify... Um, this whole period there is uh, the Lord will come as a thief. Now, coming as a thief, um, what that means is, is that not that believers are going to be surprised and caught off guard and embarrassed or whatever. Coming as a thief means, when, for instance, when Jesus used this in the Mount of Olives, his Olivet Discourse, 
He gave examples such as um, Lot, in the days of Lot, and he also gave as in the days of Noah. And so who are the ones that the day came as a thief to? The day didn't come as a thief, didn't catch Noah off guard and his family, especially after all those animals started loading up into the ark, right? That's pretty much a clue that, oh, I think, you know, time's getting short here. And you guys better grab your stuff because God's walking the animals on board the ark, you know. And you feel a raindrop and you go, ooh, what was that? Um, Lot wasn't caught off guard because, you know, Abraham came with some angels in tow. And they said, come on, we got to go because we can't do anything until you're out of town. So it didn't catch them off guard as a thief. So it's the unbelievers who are cut off guard. So this judgment of the Lord, it's um, who it catches off guard, this judgment, are the unbelievers, and that begins at the beginning of the tribulation. Now, no one's going to be too surprised and caught off guard at the end of the tribulation, right? Because you will have had seven years building and building and building to a crescendo so that by the time you get to um, the end of the tribulation, nobody should be caught off guard and, and caught off guard like a thief then. So is it when he comes down with the concord? That's when that's when it reaches its pinnacle because then you've got, remember it says when he comes down, for instance, in Basra, and um, the earth is melting under his feet and he's slaughtering the armies who are out there toward the valley of the ghetto. And that's the ultimate pinnacle here. But I mean, uh, I mean the entire, that is the day of the Lord, but the entire tribulation week builds toward that because you've got, uh, for instance, in, in the middle of the tribulation, starting in, in um, Revelation chapter 12, you've ha had Satan's wings clipped, as it were, um, by Michael. He gets cast down to earth once and for all. And then um, Satan's wrath is going after the saints, going after the elect. Um, begins happening, and they run and flee to the, the hills. And then you've got um, um, a couple more woes happen. You've already had all this demonic activity happen upon the earth, and you've got these, including some loosed out of the abyss, some giant horse-like creatures, or creatures riding these horse-like things that have fire spitting out of their tails, and they breathe fire out of their mouths, and all this stuff happening, it's, I don't know, it's kind of hard to picture, and but uh, you know, you've got thousands and thousands of these. I never read, I mean, I heard um, the Lord will come like a thief in the night. I never really read the whole verse. <laughs> mm -hmm. I always just thought it was the rapture. Well, and, and that's what a lot of people will say, and... Yeah. and um, you see. I see the rest of the verse. Yeah. Well, I mean, this isn't the only place that mentions that because Jesus mentions like a thief, for instance. And, and you know, we see this. We see this also in Second Thessalonians. And, and But um, the rapture will be like a thief um, as far as the unbelievers are concerned because we've always been here and they'd like us to go away. And next thing you know, they're going to look up and we're gone. And we're salt, and we're the salt and the light of the earth, is what Jesus says, right? So we're going to be taken away, and that's going to catch them off guard. And then shortly thereafter, if not immediate, shortly thereafter, it will be all the judgments that start on the earth. We see, um, for instance, in verse 12 here, uh, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, um, which is, again, that's at the beginning. That's at the um, that's before the millennium, right? That's not a thousand years later. I'm looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Where are you? Verse 12. Because um, of which the heavens will be dissolved, being of fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. So there's the order of events there. Now they'll say new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Uh, we'll, they will look at this and say, well, that means eternity future. That's just, you know, what happens after the millennium. But the parent passage again, uh, Isaiah 65, describes this as 
the last final events that happened. It's all before the millennium. Um, look at real quick at not just uh, Isaiah 65 confirms about that, but I think Revelation 16. Um, look at this. Here we got the sixth bowl judgment. See, the Euphrates has been dried up. All these things happen. You know, you got men are scorched with fire. So you have the fire and all this happens, especially with the bowls. Um, I mean, the first bowl in chapter 16, verse 2, loathsome sores. And then you've got the sea turning to blood. And um, verse 3, that's the second bowl. The third bowl, you got the waters, all the water turning into blood. Fourth bowl, men are scorched. Um, the fourth bowl, okay, the angel pours it out, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over the plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Fifth bowl, darkness and pain. Sixth bowl, Euphrates is dried up. And then um, you've got... Verse 14 says, For they are spirits and demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to uh, the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So here we got Armageddon, and everybody's going to try to come against Christ. Verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. There's your phrase. So that is the very end of the tribulation, right? I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. So that's when this happens. So Second Peter 3, where he comes like a thief, the day of the Lord coming like a thief is the end of, that's an Armageddon in the tribulation. That's not a thousand years later at the end of the millennium. So we've got this between this and between Isaiah 65. You've got these events for all, everything firm and heat and everything happening. And, and uh, this description in here, and a lot of it's hyperbole, which is a very common um, Hebrew way of writing is just exaggerative language. Uh, this all happens during the tribulation period, and in particular during the bowls when Christ comes and he says he's coming and he's coming like a thief. And that nails it down in Revelation 16 and in Isaiah 65 is at the very end of the great tribulation, not a thousand years later after the millennium. So this passage here in Second Peter is tribulation passage. It's not a post-millennium passage. So... Um, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Is talking about looking forward to the kingdom. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And so that's his. Uh, so I, I just wanted to go through that because we didn't go through kind of a, an overview last week, which we probably should have done in the lead up to going into Isaiah 65. But again, you want to write in, in your notes, Second Peter 3, that people will point to all the time, those two passages, the one being Isaiah 65, which describes it as um, the beginning of the, the new heaven and new earth at the beginning of the millennium, and Revelation 16, him coming like a thief, um, and all the things he's describing here is... Um, the same thing what Jesus said in to describe his coming at the Valley of um, Megiddo and Armageddon in Revelation 16. So you'll want those those two. So so we get into there's there's the timing of that. And um, like I said, I uh, thunder. Yeah. Like I said, I wanted to to get into that, and and I, I this is all part and parcel of um, this restorationist mentality that I'm kind of been parked at for um, some years at now, where uh, new heaven, new earth happens at the beginning of the millennium, not at the end of the millennium, 
And um, Jesus of necessity will have to do that because um, the world will be so completely wiped out by the end of the tribulation that when Christ comes back, the things we describe in kingdom, including in all the Old Testament kingdom passages, talk about it being idyllic, you know, and it's like a return to paradise, the garden. So Jesus is going to have to do it. Now, is Jesus going to, does he ever do anything halfway, you know? And then if he does it and he sets it up and and he's been ruling with a rod of iron and we've been ruling with him for a thousand years and uh, all the things that we described that happened during the kingdom period, um, is he going to have to nuke everything then? If he didn't do it at the beginning of the kingdom, at the, end of, at the end of the kingdom, when everything's been new and idyllic and he's made everything new and got everything set up, uh, is that going to be a better place for him to nuke everything and destroy everything and start all over? You know, does it, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't square. Especially with all these, the passages that you shared in uh, this last week and in the week before about all the things that are eternal concerning the kingdom. Like when he the branch Messiah himself builds the temple that will stand forever and ever. Um, and when he talks about, when he's talking to Israel and Jacob, getting them into the land, and they will be there where their fathers walk, and they'll be there forever and ever. And once they're there in the land, they'll never be rooted out again. Right? So if you're talking about a new heaven and new earth being destroying everything from whole cloth and starting all over from nothing, then they they'd have to be rooted out temporarily, make new ones, and it wouldn't be the same land anymore. And it's a whole new creation out of whole cloth. And um, so again, to to just to kind of emphasize that, we also went into um, Revelation twenty one. And we, we may as well go to Revelation twenty one because now we're going to really start going through verse by verse through this. And I'm hoping what you see is that. Revelation chapter 20, um, you know, as I pointed out before, is we've had chapter 19, we've had the second coming, and um, you've got the rejoicing happening because now it's time for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, I want to point out that the marriage supper of the Lamb, according to the, this, particularly the Galilean um, Hebrew tradition, happens at the end of the one week of wedding celebration. So um, everybody's been brought into the father's house. The doors were closed. Uh, doesn't matter if the bridemaids got locked out or not. They're knocking on the door. Um, they're too late to come in. Nobody comes in. Nobody goes out for a week. They're feasting and they're celebrating. So it's not like they're not eating and not having a supper, but they're celebrating for a week. At the end of the week, the doors are open. They come out, then you've got the public supper. And in this case, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb, but you have the official marriage supper at the end. The bride, now wife, is presented. Ta-da, here she is. She's unveiled. It's who everybody knew it was anyway, but she's presented, and they have the supper, and it goes on for forever, too. So they, because they like to party, just, just like uh, when I was in, living in the Southwest with the Mexican families, they like to party forever and ever. And it's not necessarily an ending deadline when that stops. They just like to, they just like to uh, keep eating and feasting and partying. So it's a great atmosphere, a lot of fun. So same kind of thing you know, at the end. So you've got that, and then you've got another feast that it describes in here, another supper though, that um, the birds of prey, the predator birds rather, the, the carrion birds eating and feasting off the animals that were destroyed. So then we have this break, um, is, the, is the best way I understand it, uh, in chapter 20, where, um, you know, you, you, it's kind of like, wait, hold, stop the presses, pause, wait right there, wait. What happens to Satan and the demons at this point? Because, you know, you've got these two suppers going on. What happened to him? What happened to the satanic trinity? Okay, wait, wait, wait. What happens to what happens to the people who are not believers that are still alive? Okay, 
what happens to the believers that are still alive and what happens to them? Okay, now that I get, that's the marriage supper thing. So chapter 20 is just kind of an overview of this next section in time, this millennial kingdom, where it says six times in here that this period's a thousand years. I have nothing to disabuse me of thinking it's, it says thousand, that it doesn't mean a thousand. Um, a lot of people will argue that, but it says here, um, bound him for a thousand years in verse two and cast him in the bottomless pit, um, put a seal on him. And then he'll deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Um, then after these things, he'll be released for a little while. So all of a sudden there, we jump to the very end of a thousand years and we get a description of what happens there. And I thought thrones and they had sat upon them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. So this all, we know that this beheading and stuff really happens, ramps up pretty good in, um, during the tribulation period. And they and to verify that this is the period they're talking about, who are the ones who are beheaded? And um, what was their witness about? Uh, who had not, let's see here. Uh, verse 5, verse 4, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead. So it's a very specific set of martyrs that it's talking about. So it's not talking about people all through time and martyrs all through time. We've had that, but here he's addressing, answering the question that's going to be in the back of people's minds. He's trying to anticipate that. And that is, well, wait a minute, what about all those believers the saints who died during this one week tribulation period and they didn't take the mark of the beast or anything uh, on the foreheads or on their hands. And um, he's talking about them. They're the ones on these thrones and um, the rest of the dead, the unbelievers um, did not live again for a thousand, until the thousand years are finished. Now what happens at the end of the thousand years? Then he gets into um Eventually, here in the chapter, he gets into the great white throne judgment. So, verse 11, here he's talking about the great white throne judgment, and that's where the second resurrection, which is not the good, happy resurrection, and that's the one where people are resurrected and judged by God, and um, death and Hades, everything is thrown into the lake of fire. So, so you got this picture here, and to show, again, that chapter 20 doesn't seem to make sense to me as a chronology uh, going from chapter 19 strictly. Or look at it, you don't have to look at it more as a parenthetical. You can look at it as a parallel. Chapter 20 is a parallel chapter. So you've got, you've got leading up to this, you've got um, chapter 19. Um, and then getting up to chapter 19, you can look at it as a parallel, a split, if you will. So uh, chapter 20 describes kind of an overview of what's happening during the millennium. Chapter 21 kind of picks up the narrative and gets more specific on some details, specifically about the second coming and the church, because everything's been um, for all this time here. He's, a, he's addressed church at the very beginning of the book, and we had the seven churches. Church is, is gone and it's not on the earth. Well, what happened to all those people? What happened to all that? Uh, you know, so it's kind of a continuation in chapter 20 in that way, because he's never really, he addressed the saints, the martyrs, saints who lived through the tribulation and go on in and get their, uh, get to go into the kingdom but then he also addresses um, saints who were killed and they died during the tribulation. Wait a minute, what about the saints before that? Okay, so then we get to chapter 21. Chapter 21 says what? Now, I saw, and I know he's not saying then, I saw as in uh, like a, a next order of events. So chapter 21, now I saw a new heaven and new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away the uh, prototypes. Also, there was uh, no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared, prepared how? Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a voice, a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, in other words, the dwelling of God, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, does that happen after the kingdom? Or does Jesus, does God dwell on the earth during the kingdom? Well, during. So we see the new Jerusalem coming down um, at the beginning because that is where um, the church returns with Christ. So we're not up there waiting, hanging around in heaven for a thousand years. We return with him, right? And then what happens? He says, um, in describing them, he says in verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. That's an awesome thing I think that we're all looking forward to, right? Is we've been waiting and anticipating for so long um, this time when uh, everything that's been wrong in the world and all of creation has been set right. Everything is corrected. Everything was, I won't say as God intended, um, because he intended everything to happen just the way it's happening now. And I think that's when we as Christians say we want justice, that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for other people to, I don't want God for other people per se, you know, but that's what we're looking for, what we're longing for, is everything to be right the way that God is right. Yeah, everything, yeah. And so that with uh, all the evil and sin, and, 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 you know, for me, it's not just, sin going on in, in the world and with other people and things I'm tired of seeing, but it's my own sin too. You know, every time it raises its head, I'm tired of it. You know, I'm tired of that struggle. I don't want to sin anymore. I don't want to have any of those issues anymore. And so uh, I'm waiting for all those things to, to pass away. I'm waiting for um, Christ to establish his kingdom and for our part in it. And we're going to be dwelling in, in uh, New Jerusalem. So then... This is key, what's happening here, and this describes further the reason why you don't need a remaking of things at the end of the millennium and nuking every, everything. Um, verse 5 says, And he who is seated on the throne said, first of all, who's seated on the throne? We just saw a bunch of people with crowns seated on thrones, right? This is different though, right? Christ. It's Christ. Behold, I am making all things new, not I'm gonna. He says, I am. He's saying, behold, look at this. Look what I'm doing. Because he's already put his foot down on the Mount of Olives, right? And now we got fresh water gushing out. And the description comes, especially from the Old Testament. we got all this healing water flooding out and going into the, the seas, the oceans of the earth. Um, he also said, write this down. In other words, mark this. Be aware of this. It's as good as done. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. It's a done deal. Why is that? Because sovereign God is saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. God is speaking. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, detestable, as for the murderers and sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all the liars, their portion will, like it hasn't happened yet, be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So we've had, as I've pointed out, ad nauseum chapter 20 you've already had the great white throne judgment so where do you get this cowardly faithless detestable murderous sexually immoral sorcerers idolaters and all these liars from well because chapter 20 and 21 are really kind of a parallel chapters i guess we could call it that if you prefer um chapter 20 is looking at an overview of 
the entire thousand years. Revelation 21 picks up what you might see from the earth, the narrative from the earth where you've had the second coming. Christ comes down on the white horse, we with him. New Jerusalem is coming down, and we've got the marriage supper of the Lamb happening, and Jesus is making all things new. So what you've got is you've got the bride announced, chapter 19, it says, Let us re rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. That's in chapter 19. Then you got to chapter 21, the bride is introduced. Chapter 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So you see how those are connected there, I hope. Then, this is an interesting thing, too, because if this, I'm trying to show you some of the disconnects here of what's traditionally in dispensationalism, where this supposedly chapter 21 happens after the thousand years and why I've got issues with it. Here's another issue with it right here. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, so for a thousand years, that angel's just been hanging out there holding that bowl. One of those seven angels kind of came. Yeah, like Vanna. Yeah, so hanging out there, kind of waiting for his big opportunity to come to John and say, now. And so it's at the end of it. Makes more sense that it's happened right away because he's watching. He hasn't flown away yet with this bowl. All this stuff happening, and he's here for the fireworks and watching everything happen. And then he speaks to John. He says, come, I'm going to show you the bride, the wife of the lad, because we're now married, right? We just had this seven-year celebration period. And he carried me away in the spirit. Now, just, just to nail down that, New Jerusalem is about the church, the bride of Christ. He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Verse 10, in the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Verse 11, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. And at the 12 gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates, just to make it clear. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. I don't know the purpose of that. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? 12 different foundations, usually on one. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So it's kind of an all-inclusive kind of a, a thing here that's designed in this great um, mansion that the Lord's made that has many rooms. So um, Jesus left a couple thousand years ago. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And this is what he's been working on for all this time. And when he's done and the father feels like he's done with this task and he's also building his church in the marriage supper tradition, the father would check it out and he would give it the thumbs up and say, go get your bride. So this is what's happened. Now we've been there. We've been hanging out there celebrating. And um, this is our new home. And, and, he will tabernacle with us where he goes we go heaven is wherever god is we're going to have heaven on earth and it begins during the tribulation period now the number 12 what is the significance we usually see in the number 12 because we see it so often beginning in the old testament what does it mean guesses 12 is typically the number that you'll see you get the best way to probably look at it is the number of perfect government when man does things, man's efforts at government, it's usually, it'll be indicated with the number 10 very frequently. So it's an imperfect government. Just like you have the 10 nation confederacy, and you've got the the 10 nations in the book of Revelation and so forth, is, and uh, 10 kings and stuff, if it falls short, God's uh, 
form of governing things is is now always in 12s so that's what we see so verse 5 speaks of the recreation process it's in the present tense now verse 6 ties this to the beginning of the millennium giving the spring water of life um it's is pending verse 7 speaks of the things as a heritage um uh, future would be will not has so it's a has to do with the heritage not as completed as uh, would be the case after the great white throne judgment and then verse 8 also speaks of future tense like a, a pre great white throne judgment so we haven't we haven't gotten to the great white throne judgment yet as of chapter 21 um this passage here that we're at we're not there because you still have also you still have the you know these liars and thieves and all the other sinners there and then um verse 15 and the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls the city lies four square its length is the same as its width and he measured the city with his rod 12,000 stadia its length and width and height are equal he also measured its wall 144 cubits by human measurement which is also an angel's measurement so that means angels and humans are roughly the same size usually i guess right it's the same measurement the wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold like clear glass well, let's get into some of these dimensions and things and see some things about it um the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel the first was jasper the second sapphire the third agate the fourth emerald the fifth onyx and then you got carnelian chrysolite beryl topaz uh chrysoparth chrysoprase chrysoprase uh jacinth amethyst and the 12 gates were uh, 12 pearls. Each of the gates were made of a single pearl. How would you like to see the animal that made that? And there's a big oyster. I like it. <laughs> and, and more. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Like I said, a lot of times when you read about and you hear about heaven, people will go to this verse this would be a famous go-to verse but this is specifically new jerusalem coming down out of heaven and coming down out of heaven and not what's heaven now where god the father is dwelling and jesus sitting at the right hand of the father and all of that so these verses get mixed and mingled very often but it's very specifically particular to um new jerusalem uh, a lot of people will do go through a lot of gymnastics to try to point out what the symbolism is of the uh, the onyx and the burl and carnelian and all of these and the topaz and um you know you're welcome to it you know, do your best with it a lot of people have done it over the years and they don't all agree uh, it could be too that i'm sure there's some meaning behind it but it could just be too that uh, god likes to create beauty and he like he thought they were beautiful and so he put them in there because they're beautiful uh, i don't know if there's a particular order and a reason why he does it the way he does i don't think he does anything accidentally but uh you know i just come to the conclusion that he does it because he wants it to be beautiful and as beautiful as it could possibly be and so he he did it that way but if you ever find anything that's uh coherent and make sense and tie all these uh, passages going all the way back to the Old Testament to all these different stones. Um, you know, you let me know. Uh, we do see a lot of the stones the same as what the plates are on the front of what the priests wore um, in the temple. But uh, each one was assigned to a different tribe, for instance. Um, so have fun with that. Do, do with that as you will. Um, for instance, uh, the uh, the jasper. Um, it's clear. It's associated with um, Pisces. God set those things in order. The Maseroth for um, a reason to glorify Himself. But it's also 
um, associated with Simeon, the sapphire is blue. You will find that in Ezekiel or Exodus 24.10, the, the foundation of God. Uh, Moffat says um, um, that it's blue as well. Pliny, opaque with gold specks, um, and Petri agrees. And so it's associated with uh, Aquarius and Reuben. Um, Chalcedony, um, it's, it's supposed to be greenish. Robertson says it's a green silicate of copper associated with Capricorn and uh, Naphtali. The emerald, of course, is green. It's associated with Sagittarius and Asher. Um, Sardonyx is red. Robertson says uh, it's white with layers of red associated with Scorpio and Dan. Um, Dan is one of those cursed, by the way. Sorry, Scorpios. Not that we believe horoscope anyway. But. Yeah, why is that in there? Well, because those, those, um, you know, uh, celestial um, constellations and things that we see are all part of the ancient Hebrew Matzeroth before Satan got a hold of it and corrupted it. And it says what Satan does is he takes it and says they, they kind of rule and run your life and how their order is and stuff. It, it controls your life. And God says, no, I control lives, not the stars. The stars. Yeah, I mean, they're constellations. And they used to, in the old days, they used to use those constellations, which don't really look like what they are. I don't know if there's a time where they lined up where they look more like what they are, because you can use software and you can run things back and look up and see. And I still don't really much see it. But they used to use those to teach their kids uh, um, in the Matzeroth is what they call them, not the horoscope. Um, basically, God's plan of salvation. That's another lesson in, in story that you could look up. And, and it, you could do, we could do a whole lesson on that one alone. But, you know, time doesn't really um, permit us to go into that tonight. But um, they used to use the Matzeroth to teach their children um, God's plan of redemption through the ages. So those shapes all came into all had different meaning and, and things back then. So they do not order our lives, though. The Lord orders them and he orders us as well. Um, chrysolite. It's a golden yellow. Uh, Moffat says it's golden blue. Robinson says it's golden like topaz. Um, so, so there's this disagreement even among the theologians. Um, and it's associated with uh, Virgo and Zebulun. Burl is green. Robertson says green like an emerald. Pliny says more like sea green. But anyway, it's associated with Leo and uh, also with Judah. Leo is the lion, the lion of Judah being Christ. Um, topaz is a greenish stone. Robertson says it's gold and greenish stone. Anyway, it's associated with uh, Cancer and Issachar. Uh, for Cypressus, I'm probably butchering that, is a gold green. Robertson says it's uh, like a golden leek. Um, International Bible Encyclopedia says it's a sea green. It's associated with Gemini and, and uh, the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, adjacent um, is violet, hyacinth, associated with uh, Taurus or Joseph. Amethyst is purple. It's associated with Aries uh, and uh, with Gad. So you see how you can get into some of that, and then you could run that down, and you could probably spend uh, several months on that trying to trace all those down and what the meanings are. I think God just wants to be all inclusive of everybody and their um, associated stones that were associated with their tribes back the way He ordered things during the Pentateuch when He pulled all that together, the priesthood and so forth, and. And we see the names on the gates and so forth and in the foundations. And so God is just, it's his way of incorporating all of it into his, you know, this additional creation that he's, he's bringing. Here's the scope of the uh, New Jerusalem. That's how big it is. Pretty big, isn't it? So it's about 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles and then 15 miles high. 1,500 miles high, 100, not 15 miles, 1,500 miles. 
So, I mean, not Jerusalem. Old Jerusalem or Israel, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So that's why they say it won't be like sitting down on the earth and dust. But it's going to probably hover above the earth you know, at a certain level. At least high enough to where you won't bump your head on it. Uh, as you said, it's kind of big. Somebody had fun with that, folding it, measuring it just so precisely. Probably just Google Earth or something and fold the paper to make just the right size. Um, what you see is where the airplane is, that's how high airplanes fly. Jets typically fly approximately six and a half miles high, and the cabin must be pressurized. So you can see we're going to be living in parts of it that aren't even pressurized. In fact, they're going to go all the way up in, in, into space. Is New Jerusalem going to be pressurized? I don't know. I, I, I don't know that it has to be. Um, it can be if God wants it to be. We won't need to have air, per se, you know, not like we're going to die. Um, so who knows exactly? So you can see down there in the green where the ozone layer is and where clouds are up in the red all the way down um, toward the bottom. So just to give an idea of how far up it is, um, and you can see where the exosphere is and so forth. Outer space, you're in outer space way up there toward the top. I mean, you're not. You know, there's there's no air there. So there won't be any mortals going in to visit, at least the upper layers. They might be able to go on the ground floor and go into the you know, the mezzanine. Uh, yeah. Really, really big. That's how big it is next to where outer space starts. See that red line at the very top over there on the left? So you can see the upper half is entirely you know, up in outer space. And that's if you had it pretty much sitting on the ground. So it's it's massive. You don't think about how high space is and 1,500 miles, how high 1,500 miles is or whatever. But you know, that's how it works out. Fascinating, isn't it? No, I just want it. I just want it. Your husband's phone, you're like, yeah. Looking, you know, I just get it. Yeah, I'm ready for it now. All right. Verse 22. Um, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. That's fascinating, isn't it? Because we also read in, in the book of First Corinthians, that we are the temple. So see how this is all church-related. Now, recall, though, Ezekiel 40 through 48 is this description of this big temple that's on the earth, right? So keep that in the back of mind. So there is a temple, but the temple's on the earth, but there's no temple in New Jerusalem, just in Old Jerusalem. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no, no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now this all, again, I want to emphasize, reads more like during the millennium and not after the millennium, because none of that stuff can happen and no people can... After the millennium, everybody's going to be immortal, glorified bodies. And everybody else is already in hell by then, right? So just, just to put yet one more nail in that coffin of, of that teaching that all this happens after the millennium. So Old Jerusalem has a temple, Ezekiel 40, 44, like now before, um, but in, that's also described as, uh, see here's Solomon's temple, um, the way it was laid out, laid out kind of differently. Here's Ezekiel's temple, and as you can see, it's laid out really differently. 
the, there are verses there and the key on the right hand side that tell you what chapter um, these things are are um, described in and um, they've gone to great lengths to look at this and to plot, plot it all out. Here's the size comparisons of the various temples. Um, the big brown one on the left hand side is Ezekiel's temple. There's never been anything of that scope, that size. Um, it's completely different. And it's, it's going to be different too from what happens during the tribulation. The question invariably comes up, well, we, what do we need temple for? Will God sanctify the temple? We've discussed this a little bit before. Um, will there be sacrifices, those kinds of things? We do read, in when you're reading in Ezekiel, we do read of, of, of sacrifices. And people say, well, what do we need sacrifices for? Isn't that blasphemous because Jesus is the final sacrifice? He's the Lamb of God. Well, Jesus was, it says, I think it's in Colossians, that Christ died before the foundations of the earth. In other words, the commitment toward that all happened before the foundations of the earth. So there's been that commitment to the Lamb of God, the Messiah, being the sacrifice um, from the very beginning of time. So why did God institute animal sacrifices in the first place? Well, it was all a type to point to Christ. Ezekiel's temple will point to Christ as well, but it's pointing backwards. So it's all to memorialize, and that's what they mean by a memorial temple and memorial sacrifices. We do see this in here, and it's all to, to, to point toward Messiah and the amount of blood spilled and the cost that it, it took. We're going to have a whole generation come up during the millennium who's not familiar with, uh, you know, everything that the Messiah went through. So everybody has to be taught the same way. Right now we've got scripture, um, but this is the time when it's going to be not just scripture, but it's going to be, you know, live action. It's going to be the real deal happening. The, um, the location is, um, from what I understand, this is too large in scope to fit on top of the so-called Temple Mount. But as we've discussed before, uh, the earlier temples were not in the Temple Mount anyway. The instructions going to Solomon was in um, the city of David. The city of David is a quarter mile south of the Temple Mount, um, even still. So that was a, a Roman garrison on top of the Temple Mount. Um, and we part of the way we know that is because the structure is still there and people still go and they pray to that wall and they bow to that wall and they step prayers into that wall. But Je what did Jesus say um, when he went and visited? He says, not one stone would be left on top of another. The whole complex would be brought down. And you still have the original cobblestones on the ground. What we read about history is that when the temple during Christ's time in 70 AD was destroyed, all the stones were cast down. The Romans took their spears and they pried up all the stones to get at the gold that melted and went down into the stone. That matches the city of David that does not mount, match what we see on top of the Temple Mount. So it doesn't matter if they do build um, a third temple during the tribulation um, on top of the Temple Mount. Um, that one's going to be desecrated by the Antichrist, by the way. We're, we see where that happens, right? Um, chapter 13, where the uh, false prophet builds an image and puts it in there. So, and that begins from there to chapter 22, which we'll, we will get into next time, and that will close out the entire book. But any questions about Revelation chapter 21, the timing of all of this, did I, did I assuage any doubts that all this stuff happens during the millennium and, and not after the millennium? Do we still have questions and doubts that we can answer or discuss? You know, when you talk about restoration, this is how it's going to just renew it. It doesn't really explain the passages in 2 Peter, only in Revelation, where it says, in the old time, the first time, the first time, the first time, the first time, or they're burned up in Tennessee. Well, I don't know. It's yeah. Yeah. Well, the um, passed away. Um, if I guess you could look up passed away and see if there's anything particular in in that, but um, the language is very similar to where 
what uh, was described of the flood because the in the flood it was talking it was talking in similar terms of where it was destruction the earth was destroyed so was the earth completely destroyed or was it restored after the flood because if if the earth was completely after the flood was completely remade new then we're on the second heaven or we're on the second earth right now but what we got in revelation is we got the first earth and it's the same argument that i would use too for saying that well was there a gap theory where there was an earlier earth or whatever and not you know that people will go into that and well, a lot of people well it's the way that isn't so much as the the you know elements burned up on the tree yeah and so, well but it's a little bit it is, but what's problematic too is you still have the issues of you're going to dwell where your fathers, you're going to walk where the fathers walk forever and ever, and the temple's going to be there forever and ever, those types of language. So what you got to do is you can say, well, given what we know about the temple has to be there forever and ever, you're going to walk where your fathers walk forever and ever, and you'll never be brought out of it. You got to say, well, how do we make these fit together? And the only thing you can come to grips with us passed away means in the new creation or in restoration when jesus says behold i make all things new but it doesn't mean he's got to destroy and nuke everything to make it new because the word new again is the same version of new it's the same word new that has to do with our new heart mm -hmm. or we're a new creation god didn't have to completely nuke us in a fervent heat and then remake us to make us new or whole so that's that kind of a thing so the only th that's why I said the only conclusion I can come to then with 2 Peter 3, if you have the heavens rolled up like a scroll, you have, do have a description of that in Revelation, but where is it? Way up there in chapter 6. And it uses the same type of language. Well, did the heavens roll up like a scroll and completely go away or whatever? No, because you can't, how long can you breathe without air? So if that happened in Revelation 6, I think that's the kickoff before a wrath started. And then what Peter's describing is that whole period of tribulation. You do have as heavens just rolled up like a scroll, and you also have the fervent heat described. Um, people are scorched in the bowl judgments, and you got so you and that and everything in between. So I can't, I can't, um, I, I can look at Second Peter three and say, well, I have to reconcile it, but I've got to reconcile um, new heaven and new earth. I can reconcile that by looking at, well, we're new creatures. I got to look at, I have to reconcile it with all the Old Testament promises about you're going to go into the promised land. You're going to dwell where your father, walk where your fathers walk, and you're going to be there forever and ever. And those types of language there, how do I reconcile this? The only thing I can do is that, well, Peter is engaging in a lot of hyperbole there when he's talking about how bad, and, you know, it's going to be during the, tribulation because he's letting people know that's when judgment's happening and because he's talking about judgment second peter knowing that all scripture has to work together and you have to pull all those passages together that's the only way i can do it to make it all work um i can't make it work even with the timing of the traditional dispensational view of well there's going to be a new heaven and new earth and it all happens afterwards why well because it's in chapter 21 well New Jerusalem's in chapter 21 too. So you can't say that. All these descriptions you got in chapter 21 that take place after the great white throne judgment of chapter 20. So you can't stick a pen in chapter 20 and say, well, that's great white throne judgment. That's the end of everything. Then we go into eternity future. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, now we're talking about the future after the millennium. And you got all these things about sinners and profane people and all these things that happen. And and the bride coming and so wait a minute that should have happened a thousand years so all these things the timing doesn't work like that so but if you just simply say look how does it read if we leave second peter three out of the equation um and then we go into chapter 19 we read chapter 20 is going kind of parallel but a different form of narrative an overview narrative in chapter 20 and then go to chapter 21 from chapter 19 um it kind of fits but then it really fits, what really nailed it down for me is going into the parent chapter for Peter and the one that's in a lot of Bible margins in, in your notes of your Bible will take you back to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, what does it say? There's a new heaven, a new earth, and then it starts talking about 
the millennium, the kingdom. That all happens along with that, not after. So then you got to hang all these together and kind of go, okay, so how does 2 Peter fit into all that timing then? You take 2 Peter out and it all works. How do you plug 2 Peter in? 2 Peter is about exaggerative language about the tribulation period. So that's kind of where I, I landed. But think about it. Um, there's another way to look at it. I haven't found it yet, but I've I tried over the years different ways of poking holes in it and making it work. That's what works for me. It seems to make more sense uh, without inconsistencies of things like what's the angel doing up there a thousand years later. Why would New Jerusalem be up there after the thousand years? What, it's our home. Why would it come down? You know, all those things. Yeah. Well, I have no problem with New Jerusalem forgetting us. Yeah. yeah. A lot more sense than yeah, but it's a new Jerusalem where it's described, or new heaven and new earth is described before the new Jerusalem is. So what I'm saying it's the timing wise. It's like so you got to go. Well, okay, well, if that's if that's possible, then do I need to re-examine the way I'm looking at the timing of this? That's all I'm just all I'm saying. All right. So with that, we'll. Uh, brings to a close and we'll close in prayer and um then we'll finish up the whole book put a nice neat little bow on it next week and it might be a relatively short lesson or whatever but um we'll do the final final chapter it doesn't have to be like i said there's a lot of detail you could get into in chapter 22 but we're going to go through chapter 22 and and pull it all together and and call it good all right Lord, thank you so much for the blessings of your word. And sometimes um, the way you design things and plan things is much more complex than what we can comprehend. But at the same time, you um, try not to confound and confuse us. You're the not the author of confusion, but our own minds can do that. Sometimes we can overly complicate things. And... Um, Lord, the, the way we overly complicate things very often is we come in with a preconception, a notion of, of how things we taught or we, we think they should be. And they end up differently um, when we get into the text. But we're reluctant sometimes to change things, Lord. And, and we don't want to change things, the text, just for the sake of changing them. We don't want to come up with something completely novel that has a good chance of being wrong, God, we, we just want to seek truth. And we want to look into the things that you've done and the things that you're planning on doing and to understand them, to comprehend them, um, because we're curious and you've you've made us to be curious. And God, we, we ask that you would um, help us to comprehend these things, help us to understand them, give us wisdom, Lord. And um, it's such a blessing to look into your word and to look into the, these things that you have in store for us as far as we can comprehend it. And this next week, Lord, we look forward to um, seeing more, closing this out. And um, Lord, we really look forward to um, seeing the end of all things because it means us dwelling forever with you. For it's in Christ's name we do pray and give you thanks. Amen.